who were deported. We lived from day to day, not knowing if we, we would be there tomorrow. The NKVD precursors of the KGB would arrive at four in the morning when you'd given up your vigil and fallen asleep. You were hauled out of your house, thrown into a curtained car and disappeared. No one would see you go. You would not know what you were accused of, nor would you have a trial. As we lived in a relatively large town, Brackfere, and we had a relatively large apartment, we were told we would be housing a Soviet officer. My mother's mother, who was staying with us after the deportation of her son, had to move into a room with Milvi and me. Despite previous Soviet proclamations, private property was to become Soviet property. The small farms which had been family owned and operated were to be collectivized. All produce from them was to be sent to Russia. Then Hitler became greedy and committed what the world considers his biggest mistake. He thought he could chase the Soviets back home and take Russia. Once Estonians realized that help was at hand to drive the Russians out, many joined the German army to do just that. The Russian generals, meantime, ordered the scorch earth policy as their troops started to withdraw. They also ordered the formation of destruction battalions, which any Soviet sympathizers could join. These battalions were given free reign to rob, torture, burn or kill anyone who did not share their political beliefs or anyone they didn't like. In a last bit, the Soviets conscripted 40,000 Estonian men into the army. If you didn't go, your families would be killed or deported. And can't we re uh, recognize similarities to what is happening with ISIS? Have all those thousands of Syrians joined ISIS because they believe in extreme Islam? Isn't it rather they're trying to save the lives of their families? Yes, we all know they're idiots from England and the US and other parts of Europe flying there to help, but I'm pretty sure most of those um, in Syria are not fighting uh, of their own free will. Pro-independence partisans to escape conscription fled to the forest and waged war against the destruction battalions and the retreating Soviet army. Many of the conscripted Estonians fled once they crossed the Russian border, when there could no longer be repercussions against their families, and they joined up with the oncoming German army. With the coming of the Wehrmacht, life changed again. After the horrors of the mass deportations, we rejoiced at their arrival. There was dancing in the streets. Yes, they'd always been our enemies, but they put an end to the deaths and deportations, and that gave us hope. Nothing could have been as terrifying as the Soviet forces and their treatment of us. The German occupation also put an end to the nighttime raids and daily life for locals became bearable again. We were an occupied country in the wartime, but our, occupy, our occupiers were not intending to stay and we could believe we might be free again. Germans loved their culture, and it was more in keeping with ours. Theatres opened again, concerts were held, operas performed. We went to the cinema a lot. I got to know Mickey Mouse and Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> Under the Russians, <clears throat> older children were required to work during school holidays, and this continued under the Germans. Every summer, Milby and I would be taken to Hulia to stay at Uncle Richard's farm. There's me. There I am. <laughs> my sister, my cousin Eino, and his sister Aino. We tried to replicate that picture in, 19, in uh, 2008, but my sister wasn't with me that trip. So now we have Aino and we have Eino, <laughs> as they are. Milvi was required to do farm work while Uncle Richard's two children and I helped our grandmother in the house and barnyard. My clearest memories are of that farm, and I remember being very joyful whenever we went there, picking wild strawberries, playing with the lambs and the farmyard dog, trying to climb on the back of a cow to ride it, accompanying Uncle, Uncle Richard to town with the milk urns, playing in the clay pits and swimming in the water meadows when the snow had melted. I had no idea at all that Milvi hated it. The German officer who was stationed in our apartment asked to be called 
Uncle Bart. He was a career soldier, but at the time, um, all soldiers had to swear fealty to the ideals of Nazism. And that is what our apartment looked like in uh, 1992. This was our um, dining room window. This was the front door. We were up, up there. And this was the street outside. It amazed me. It wasn't paved even today. Well, now it probably is, but it wasn't in 1992. It looks like a country instead of a town. Uncle Bart missed his wife and children and on the first evening asked if he could eat with our family. His responsibility was liquor supplies for the troops and he would produce a bottle of this or a packet of that in times of strict rations. I was too young to know that our autonomous Jews who had been welcomed into free Estonia and who had fled from Russia to escape from persecution, fled back to Russia to escape the Nazis. About 1,000 were now left and they, herded together, and they were herded together and put into labor camps together with Soviet prisoners of war, Jews from other countries, Romani and suspected Soviet collaborators. In advance of the Soviet <coughs> forces, forces um, 2,000 of them were murdered at Kloga in, on September the 19th, 1944, that's in Estonia. The bloodiest single day civilian massacre in Estonian history. Estonia was now pronounced by the Germans with malevolent pride, Judenfrei, free of Jews. That happened the day after my family fled Estonia. Thousands of young Estonian men were now conscripted into the German army. Those who still hoped for a free Estonia fled to the forests and joined those who had, been doing, uh, who had done so during the Soviet occupation. And they became known as the Forest Brothers, which is the Estonian term for guerrilla. They survived and did battle for 10 years into the Soviet occupation. The last Forest Brother was found in 1978 he was 70 years old, refused to surrender, and preferred drowning in a lake while swimming toward freedom. The bombing started and brought a new terror. Siren would sound and our blood would freeze. We would hurry to our nearest bomb shelter, sneaking looks at the sky to catch glimpses of falling bombs. It was worse at night to be woken from sleep, wrapped in coats and blankets and made to run through the freezing night air and maybe ice and snow on the streets, to spend hours lying in a dark tunnel, dreading the arrival of bleeding victims brought in from bombed houses, waiting for them to stop screaming, for them to die. Russian bombers sounded quite different from German ones. We learned quickly which was which, and we could also tell whether they were coming or going. When they came, we made the joke, but it really did sound like this. When they were coming, it was sort of, Ayo, 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 which in Estonian, Ayo means I can't make it, I can't make it, I just can't make it. <laughs> but when they were leaving, chased by the German bombers, it was, Yoan, 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 yes I can, yes I can, yes I can. <laughs> When the bombing grew more frequent, Father, uh, Milvi and I were sent to the farm, which was 10 kilometers out of Rakvere. One night, Grandfather Nork lifted me up and took me outside to see the Christmas trees and candles, as some of the bombs were called. Rakvere was being bombed. The sky was filled with tiny lights, but nothing that resembled a Christmas tree. I was very disappointed. <laughs> the Russian winter had defeated the Nazi invaders. We knew the Russians would return. We just didn't know when. Although those who had escaped and made their way to the West had reported on the horrors of the Soviet occupation, the West now needed the Russians' help to defeat the Nazis and paid no heed to the needs of three tiny Baltic countries. My parents knew we could not stay. My father had served in the Estonian cavalry. He would be among the next to be deported. And deported is a relatively mild word. The Estonian word, kuditamine, means sent forcibly by cattle car from your own country to a slave camp somewhere far away. And it strikes terror in one's heart 
when one hears that word. These were the last pictures taken in Estonia. Um, must have been just before my sixth birthday. Thousands escaped in little boats, crossing to Finland, then to Sweden. Others tried to flee over land. If you were single and had no ties, flight was possible, but the Germans did their best to stop you and destroyed any boats they found. Now, these two actually, <clears throat> these two boats actually fled from Sweden a couple of years later, when after the war, uh, Stalin demanded that all people from the Baltic states be returned to their homelands. They would be welcomed home with open arms. They would see their loved ones again who were longing for their return. There would be no repercussions. Any who were sent back disappeared straight to the slave labor camps and never returned, never saw their relatives. But these two <clears throat> boatloads, these two people, this one family in Sailing to Freedom, the Vedam family, uh, they fled before they could be sent back from Sweden. And they bought an old rickety boat without the keel, the Erma. And 16 of them piled in there, and they crossed the ocean to the USA. It is a really exciting story. And it's very well written. You can get it from, uh, don't try Amazon, alibris.com. Amazon sells them for a couple of hundred dollars. Alibris.com will sell you one for $5 if you're interested in that. This other boat I was told about only recently, the Astrid, um, sailed from Sweden to Stornoway to tide over the winter there. And the Stornoway people welcomed them in, gave them clothing, food, etc., helped repair their boat. And then they went to Canada and they got to Canada very quickly, within two weeks. Whereas um, the Erma, went down the west coast of Europe and then went across and they had a lot of trouble with storms because they were sailing in the winter. Um, they were also accompanied by whales and dolphins and a lot of adventure. My parents had two young children. Our suitcases were packed. The Germans needed workers. Uncle Bart said he would sign our paperwork so that uh, we could leave in their troop ships and hospital ships. Um, there is now a World War II uh, museum in Tallinn, and I went there in 2011. I saw these wooden suitcases, and I knew immediately we used to have suitcases like that. Identified them immediately. These are from actual refugees. Thousands of Estonians, Latvians and Lithuanians signed up to live with the Germans. Whatever was ahead in Germany, it had to be better than the gulags. The day before departure, we were told we could take only what we could carry. The packed trunks were left behind. Mother tore pictures out of albums and packed what we would need most urgently. We left Rakvere on the afternoon of se uh, September 17th, a week after my sixth birthday, going by train to Tallinn, where we stayed the night. The next day, we were transported to Baldiski, which is on the uh, northeast coast, where we were put on a passenger ship. Women and children were crowded into cabins. Men had to stay on deck. We had a two-day, two-night journey ahead down the Baltic to Danzig. The Baltic was already beginning to freeze. There were well over a thousand persons on each ship. The second night out, we were bombed. We were also dodging torpedoes from Soviet submarines and very lucky to survive. The men came crowding into the cabin so as not to freeze to death or be hit by the strafing from the planes. The cabins were hot and stuffy. We were served food that Milvi thought was delicious. I vomited it up as soon as I'd swallowed it, and that was probably the start of my claustrophobia and seasickness, which had plagued me all my life. One ship was torpedoed on September 22nd. It was the Moiro, with 1,100 people on board. The ship was being attacked by Soviet aircraft at the same time, so people rushed into their cabins to avoid being shot. 700 perished. 
the story of the Moira became the Estonian Titanic, and it's so much in our imagination, in, uh, written into our uh, memories, uh, that every one of us who left Estonia by ship, no matter which day we left, thinks that our ship picked up some of the Moira survivors. We landed in German Poland, um, Danzig, Gdansk as it was then, and were taken to Poznan, where it was sorted out where we would be sent and what work the men would do. Single women were also allocated jobs. They were Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians. Our family was sent to a town called, in German, Obersitzko, set on both banks of a fast-flowing, that's Obersitzko then, um, fast-flowing river, Varta, full of passing icebergs, like white wreaths on a coffin. There we were housed with a Polish family. My father and the other Estonian men were sent to the forests to guard against Soviet guerrillas. They became a refugee version of Forest Brothers. They said they were never caught sight of a Russian, but occasionally slipped back into town with a haunch of venison. Food was very scarce. The first question I would ask every morning was, how many pieces of bread can I have today? If we were each allocated three pieces of bread a day, I would get one slice because the other two would be given to men who had to do manual work. My te a teacher was organized who gave German lessons to the older children. Every day, when they headed off to her house, I would follow, much to my sister's fury. The teacher tried to discourage me too, but I wasn't having it. In the end, she seated me in a corner with a book, this book, in my hands, and ignored me. I must have listened hard because I learned to read and write German during that time. As had happened in Estonia, German soldiers patrolled the streets and supervised, uh, supervised the food queues. When something edible was on its way, word spread and queues formed. We didn't know what was coming, but we desperately wanted some of it. Milvi and I would be sent to queue up. Everyone had to wear ribbons showing the colors of their flags. With our blue, black and white in our lapels, we would be inspected by the soldier or Gestapo officer on duty, and our knees would give way if he grasped us by our shoulders. It was a huge relief to find that he was pulling us to the front, front of the queue because he wanted to spike the poles lined up before us. This didn't make us popular, it made us fear for our lives, but it ensured that we got some of the food which arrived. One time, I remember, it was golden sugar crystals. Hunger made me start to eat snow, but the cold of the snow would leave white spots in my cheeks and my mother would always know, and I would be smacked because I already had a bad cough. A couple of months after arrival, we had a surprise visitor, Uncle August's son, 20-year-old Olaf, who had been conscripted into the German army, or I think he actually signed up for it, my cousin said the other day, he came to call on us. He'd been notified through the army where we were and was given a few days furlough. It was wonderful to see him, and it was the last time any of his family did see him. Two weeks later, he was killed in ambush in Czech.